Thank you for joining us today. This is Clint Byers, lead pastor of Forward Church. I pray this message blesses and encourages you. I hope it inspires transformative grace in your heart and establishes you even deeper in your new covenant identity in Christ. Now take a deep breath, become aware of God's spirit within you, and enjoy the message. I hope people come out of this detaching their identity from what they do in this temporary physical world. Like a lot of people are still working for some people, they're even busier than before. And of course, you know, we continue to pray for the healthcare workers and all those involved and actually on the front lines dealing with this issue. But I hope what's happening for you is that it's kind of shaking down to your core of what is actually really important in life. What am I actually doing with my life? Am I accomplishing anything? Why am I alive? You know, this word, why do I exist? All of these big questions come up. Of course, and we go through this whole process of your purpose is, is fulfilled when you acknowledge God as your father. In other words, your purpose is, design, is determined by your creator. He created you so that he would have you and his family as his child. When you accept Christ, you acknowledge the, father as your, the Lord as your father and that he reached out to bring you into his family. That's your purpose. You exist to be a child of God. But then from there, you determine the purpose and the meaning of your life. Now, there are absolutely assignments. There are things that God would want you to do on this planet. And I can't say that I know for sure that uh, God didn't have those things in mind for you to do, but I just really don't think that it's about a job for you. You know, there's a popular uh, radio guy, podcasting guy that great, great stuff. I don't want to name him because I don't want to downplay what he's doing. He's doing great work, but there's a tweak in the idea that of your purpose being associated with your dream job. And the language is, I want to help you find your purpose. And then it kind of transitions to let's help you find your dream job as if they're one and the same. And, and my thinking is, you know, I hope you get to work your dream job. I hope that you get to have a job where you get paid for doing what you love. But even beyond that, even if you don't like your job, even if you have financial struggles, I hope that you live a life of purpose and meaning. And I hope that you live a life of purpose and meaning out of knowing who you are in Christ and then carrying that love that you've experienced for yourself from Him into the world in some way. You know, that, that, that is really what it's all about. This world's going to change. All of these systems that we depend on, the financial system, the governmental structure, you know, being able to conveniently order from Amazon, all that stuff's going away. Like life will change and, and stuff happens. And, you know, nations have crumbled. I don't think that's happening to us and I'm not trying to be doom and gloom, but I'm just saying, you know, this mindset, this existential shift that we're going through, I hope it's bringing us back to center and focus on what's really important. You know, because unfortunately what happens, and this is my concern with how this issue is being handled in the media and government and national, you know, global reaction. My, my concern is the psychological long-term effects and uh, the, the psyche changes, how people are thinking about life from here forward. I think the seeds are being planted to be fearful of being in public, which the enemy can use being uh, the, the seeds of isolation are being planted, which nothing good happens in isolation. We just get weirder and darker in isolation. I mean, all if you look at the statistics, all the things that erodes our inner man are on the rise, uh, like domestic abuse and alcoholism and substance abuse and all the stuff that we do that brings guilt and condemnation and shame and all that stuff. All of those numbers are up right now because people are isolated. There's a couple of reasons why. One reason would be we want some type of sense of control. We want to feel like we have some type of, you know, we have some type of order, some type of control in our lives. And if you can control what you're feeling and your own desires and all that, even if it's perverted or, or, or you know, depressed or not godly, you feel some sense of normalcy. Because what we have, and I was watching Dr. Henry Cloud, and, and if you're a church leader, if you're a pastor, if you're uh, you know, involved in ministry in some way, Dr. Henry Cloud, who wrote Boundaries, has a resource called Churches That Heal. And he was walking through this idea, and it's not really new information, but I like how he organized it. And he was helping church leaders help people 
this way by talking about mind maps. You know, and the idea of a mind map is this. We, we look at our lives, we look at our homes, we look at our jobs, we look at our relationships, we look at our faith, we look at all these different areas, and we have a sense of normal. Like in our mind, we kind of have a map. If you were to think this is the map of what my life looks like, and this goes here, and this is here, 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 here. And everything, it's like somebody took that map and shook it and just drew new lines and moved everything around. And, and so what, the, what happens is, is we have to react. So you have a couple of choices when your life map, your mind maps change, and that is you either fix it or you adapt. Some things we can't fix right now. And so we're being forced to adapt. And unfortunately, in the adaptation process, which I really kind of equate to the transformational process, there's some stumbling, right? Like if you imagine this, imagine you have your home, you know, you know how your home is laid out. And let's say you have to get up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom or go get some water or something. You don't turn all the lights on. You kind of just know where everything is. Let, let's, let's say the door moved or your sofa moved or your refrigerator moved, or the toilet moved. Sorry, I know you got that visual. I'll let that play out for just a minute anyway. You know, what would you do? You're bumping into things, you're figuring things out, but, but it, it, it would take a little while, but then you'd figure it out. You could turn the lights on and, and adjust. Oh, okay, I see things. You could move things back, but there's, initi there's an initial process of stumbling and relearning and calculating and figuring. And I think even our identity gets put into a map. Like, I think we have to remember what we are as children of God in new circumstances. You know, I, I think some people are even forget that they're Christians in a situation like this. Forget that the Spirit of God is with them in a situation like this. You know, you may have found yourself wondering, well, how does faith help? Well, how does prayer, how, why should I continue to pray? Do we really need church? What is the bill? The church is not about bill. You know, all of those questions arise and we start trying to reorganize and rearrange things. And, and I think that's a good thing. It's a healthy thing to, to really look and question and, and wonder about all that stuff and, and, and come up with a new perspective. Now, also keeping in mind that we don't have to uh, lessen our expectation of the promises of God. You know, we, we, we shouldn't uh, ad adopt a new, darker view of the world because the kingdom of God is still advancing and we ultimately know we're moving toward the restoration of all things. Like when I think about the future, that's what I think about. I don't think about destruction and darkness and all the things that can happen. If God needs His church to be ready for something or make some changes, He'll let us know He'll provide in the process. Like, that's pretty much as simple as it is for me. Just expect that he will actually lead and guide us through whatever the process looks like. But I just wanted to plant that seed in your thinking. Cut yourself some slack. Give yourself a little bit of a break because everybody's adjusting and adapting. But also remember who you are. Remember what Jesus did and remember who you are. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus in the time like this? What do, what, what, how can I express my faith? What expectations can I have? You know, all of those big questions. And so today, I just wanted to go through a couple of scriptures and reinforce some things in you. Uh, you know, as Mike said earlier, some of you might be watching for the first time. Some of these things may be new to you. It may sound a little bit technical. If you watch us, if this is your church or you watch regularly, some of these identity things will sound familiar, but I hope that you take it and it helps you uh, as you're going through this perspective shift and as you're contextualizing everything in your life anew. Uh, I hope it reminds you, okay, let, yeah, let me touch base on this. Because I think, I'll just kind of give you the bottom line from the beginning and then I'll dig it out and then, and then we'll wrap it up. But believers, we have to remember that we are not contrary to God any longer. We are not in a position where we're trying to prove our faithfulness. We're not in a position where God is taking notes on what you're doing. It's like, oh boy, this pandemic is happening. Boy, you really... I thought you were stronger in your faith than that, but you're making some really bad decisions right now. And all it takes is, a little, you know, not like God sitting up there evaluating how well you're doing, adjusting to sin and death in the world. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think, I think if, if God were evaluating anything, it would be listening, you know, listening. 
Are you listening to the leading that he's giving you to remind you who you are and feed on those spiritual things that he's giving you? But even that is not like a test. So I wanted to remind you of who you are in him. Inside, you're a friend of God. You're a child of God. You are safe in his family. And even when your life feels like it's upside down, and it is for many of you, you can go back and touch base and remember who you are in him. So let's read through a couple of these passages. I'm going to start in Romans 6. That might have been the longest setup in the world for a couple of uh, scriptures. All right, so Romans 6, verse, starting in verse 1. And, and you know, th- I love this. I think we as New Covenant-focused believers... Uh, you know, I don't even really like the term grace message or hyper grace or any of that stuff. It just, it's the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. But I feel like we should memorize Romans 6 because this is what people come back that don't quite under, that don't, haven't yet seen that revelation of the freedom that we have in Christ. And this is the response. It's, it's like if, if you're preaching this stuff or trying to help people believe who God really is in terms of the finished work of the cross, you've had this conversation. You know, Paul's preaching the gospel and they're like, well, the carnal mind logically thinks, well, if it's finished, then, then uh, their heart then sends up a message, then it's okay to sin. Or you're saying that it's okay to sin. It's like, are you kidding me? What? No, I, that doesn't make any sense. So mem- I, 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 I don't want to give you the homework assignment to memorize an entire chapter, but maybe I will. That'll be your Easter homework. Memorize the entire chapter of Romans 6. All right. What shall we say? What then shall we say? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may increase? Certainly not. Or God forbid. Or, you know, my translation would say, what? How'd you come to that conclusion? Anyway. How can we who died to sin live in it any longer? Now, this is where I'm wanting to go. I want to talk about the freedom that we have as believers because freedom, it came with a price. Freedom is not free. Jesus paid for it. And freedom is not truly embraced and experienced. Freedom does not produce the fruit of the kingdom of heaven within you unless you take personal responsibility to guard and protect the freedom that you have and live well within it out of a deep sense of personal responsibility to yield to what it cost to put you in that place of freedom. And and I'm seeing connections more and more and more in how this particular nation was built. And I'll give you a little bit of a plug, Mike Crane. I know you're working on some content of, you know, having that conversation of what freedom and faith and all that looks like. Uh, Look for his YouTube channel coming soon. He's getting elbowed over there. Get to work. We want to, we need to hear it. But, um, so, so you've got a lot of freedom in your home right now. You've got a lot of freedom in your life right now. It's up to you to take personal responsibility to manage that freedom well. I don't want you to feel like you've like you got to work all day, every day, and it's like come up with these new things. It's just like, no, as I live within this situation, this new perspective, this shift in what's going on in the world and in my life, how can I make sure that I'm taking advantage and living well within the freedom that we have in Christ and let that freedom define what life looks like for me going forward. So how can we who died to sin live in it any longer? Or aren't you aware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now, as I was praying this week, the idea really came out, and it's something that I've seen before, but I feel like you know, it's kind of the focal point of this particular message And it's not that you are free from the power of sin just for the purpose of not sinning anymore, but it's really talking more about your nature and who you are. Let's keep going, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Romans 6, 4. We therefore were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, Through the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. And it's not just talking about not sinning anymore. It's talking about the types of creature that we are. Because watch where he goes next. 
For if we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. We know that our old self was crucified. I'm telling you what, this, this, is, this is more clear than anything is to come out of this. You know, everybody's re, reshaping their uh, mission statements and vision statements and all of that. And for us, it's just laser sharp focused on helping people put on the new man in the spirit of their mind so that their entire being matches who you are in your spirit, which is perfect, holy, blameless, unreprovable in his sight, as righteous as you will be. You know, all of those things that we know about what the Spirit does within us once we, you know, place our faith in him. But let me start back over here. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Remember, we're in him. These things are also true of us. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you too must not count yourselves dead, must count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. And read that again. So you too must count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. I'm going to jump over to Ephesians 2, and then I'm going to come back and read that last verse again. So you, so you too must count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, we're not talking about just dead to sinful actions, although that is part of it, but you are dead to the root of sin that was within you, that old man, that part that was crucified with Christ, that part that was removed from you with the circumcision that was performed on you without hands, the circumcision of the heart, the removal of your old heart, the installation of the new heart, God's spirit within you, all of that is you are free in that. So being free from the power of sin is not just oh, well, now I can live sinlessly or, or, or I've got to, now I have the personal responsibility to make everything, make good decisions all the time. It's, no, let me first and foremost frame my mind that I am a new person in Christ. And then living in the power of being free from the slavery of sinful actions becomes a fruit of it. And th this is really what I'm, I'm trying to say and get down to is that idea. See, we, th we as New Covenant believers hear that, that we are free from the power of sin, and then it almost puts a new type of performance mentality on us that, well, if I really am living in the power of grace, then I'm not going to sin, and then we make a mistake, and then we feel guilty. But see, you first have to realize the being free from sin that he's really talking about is your nature the kind of being that you are now. You're free from being defined as a sinner. You're not a sinner saved by grace. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You live in a place of freedom where sin cannot disrupt the kind of relationship you have with the Father, only in your mind that it does. You are the kind of being that can no longer be separated from God because you don't do everything right in your actions, because you fail to keep commandments. You are safe in the Father because you are first and foremost free from sin in the kind of being that you are. He plucked it out. He pulled that death out. He pulled the weeds of sin and death out of you and changed what you are. So I'm thinking about what does that mean in light of where we are in life right now because a lot of us are making bad decisions. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to kind of be nice about it, but I've heard from people talking about what they're going through and the thing, the old things that rise up, you know, the old behaviors, the old de depressing thoughts and all that kind of stuff. And, and it, it feels like it's kind of creeping back in and people are losing faith and losing hope because in the midst of this, even though their personal life hasn't changed and it's not that difficult, how they're reacting is driving feelings and behaviors and thoughts that are producing actions that they don't like about themselves. And you got to remember no, I, I, I'm not at enmity with, I'm not an enemy of the Father. I am not, 
I don't have, it's not natural for me to want and desire, you know, because there's so much guilt and condemnation that comes along from mismanaging freedom. Are you with me? Am I making sense? We're free, but there's a price for that freedom. There's a personal responsibility to live well within that freedom. But if you don't live well within that freedom and that guilt and shame rises up related to your behavior, reset and remember, this it's not... I'm not going to psychoanalyze myself in isolation and get depressed and drink a fifth of vodka just because I've made some bad mistakes. I'm going to go back and I'm going to remember. Don't sin, but if you do, you have an advocate with the Father. And that advocate is reminding you, I've paid the price for all this stuff. There is no guilt and shame on your life. There is no condemnation from the Father on your life. You are a new man. You are a new creature. Just remember who you are. Put that on and go back. And see, that's, that's the stumbling around that we're doing right now and responding to what's going on in the world right now is where we're trying to redefine and find that place of living successfully within the freedom that we have as believers following Christ. All right, let's jump over to Ephesians 2. <clears throat> so that's kind of the same thing, but there's a particular, some phrases in here that I really want us to focus on um, as your homework. All right. Ephesians 2, for it is by grace, this is like a really technical Easter message, right? Aren't you glad you tuned in to Easter? You thought you were going to hear about bunnies and eggs and stuff like that. But, you know, I think last year I preached like this super deep technical Easter message as well, but I, it's just what comes out of me. You know, some of you may only watch one service this year, and what I want you to come away with is God is not holding your sin against you. You're in a place of freedom with Him, and He gives you the power to live well within that freedom. And it's okay that you're stumbling around right now because you still have that advocate with the Father who's leading you into that place of success and managing this freedom well because you're a new person. So let's keep going here. Uh, Ephesians 2.8, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it's the gift of God. Praise God not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Now the legalist hears, if I'm really going to be who I'm supposed to be, then I'm doing these good works. It's like, no. Here's what he's saying here. Let me finish. Which God prepared in advance as our way of life. Um, in other words, you, God is this craftsman, and he's reshaped and recreated the kind of being that you are so that good works naturally come out of you. And you're sitting there beating yourself up because these gross works are coming out of you. These, you're feeling depressed and, and separated and, and all that darkness and all that stuff that sets in during a time like this. And you're starting to look at yourself and you're questioning. And, and some theology wants you to feel that way. Some theological systems want you to believe that you are just a depraved, disgusting, you know, like the worst thing you could imagine, and you have no chance of choosing God at all. But, you know, I won't continue how I feel about that. You might can figure that out. But you have been recreated so that good works naturally come out of you. Remember that. Let yourself off the hook a little bit. Quit beating yourself up. You've been redesigned and reshaped. The only reason you're not naturally living and managing that freedom well in now and in this kind of situation and, and even beyond is because you've just forgotten who you are for just a little while. Life has changed. Things change. You're adjusting. You're creating those new mind maps. You're finding a new normal. You might have forgotten who you are temporarily, but remember, you have been recreated into the kind of being that naturally produces good works. It's not your nature to desire darkness and sin any longer. You might temporarily behave that way. Your emotions might feel that way, but it's not who you are. You've been recreated, not so that you will do good works, but so that they will naturally come out of you. Do you see that? Like you're the kind of creature that when wound up properly and released into this earth, fueled by grace, just does good works. Like that's what you naturally crave and desire. You know you do because you feel so bad when you don't. All right. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance as our way of life. Like it's just your way of life to crave righteousness, to love righteousness, to live within holiness. 
You might not be living that way right now, but don't beat yourself up. Remember that you have an advocate with the Father. Remember that Christ Jesus was crucified for you. Remember that he rose again and conquered that stuff. Put yourself back in worship and faith toward him. That's the personal responsibility of freedom is to believe. You know, the disciples came to Jesus and said, what must we do to work the works of God? What must we do to be the type of creatures that are doing these good works? And what did he say? Believe. Only believe. Why? Because when you believe, all things become possible. And when you believe that all things are possible, you yield yourself to the kind of fueling and direction from the Lord that leads you into that type of fruit. All right. <clears throat> Let's keep going in Ephesians 2, verse 11. Therefore, is that the right next one? Yep. Yeah. All right. So 10, 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles, and now you can think of Gentiles as just outside of the family of God, outside of the chosen people. Um, Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles in the flesh and called uncircumcised by the so-called circumcision, the Israelites, the Jews at the time, that done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, alienated from the common... See, here's my point. Don't start thinking again as if you did when you were that separate from Christ person or creature. You know, you know that you're saved and safe in Him, but don't let this condemnation creep up on you because you're not living well within it. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, but no longer, without hope and without God in the world. But now... Say, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has torn down the dividing wall of hostility or enmity. And I'll finish this and then go back to that. By abolishing in his flesh the law of commandments and decrees. He did this to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace and reconciling both of them to God in one body through the cross by which he extinguished their enmity or hostility. And see, this, this, is, really the, this is the bottom line point of where I'm going today. Quit beating yourselves up and judging yourself based on your failures and based on your behavior if you've said yes to Christ and you are a born-again believer. You know, realize, yes, that is not good behavior. Yes, that is not honoring to the Father. That is behavior that is not pleasing to Him. But remember, He's not judging you based on those behaviors. And, and I'll tell you, I, I've had this conversation in the past couple of weeks with more than one person, so don't feel like I'm talking to you, but I am talking to you. But anyway... People call and begin to question their own salvation because of their mistakes. Like, like, I think that's something that's actually happening right now. And I think the enemy is waiting to pounce on that. Are you even really saved if you're behaving like this? You get, you know, life changes a little bit. Look how you're acting, you know? Life changes a little bit. You should be stronger than this. This is, this is the voice of accusation. This is the voice of, enemy, of the enemy. And this is even your own feelings towards yourself. What, what, what's wrong with you? Why are you going back to that? How, you know, what's, why are you choosing that? Why are you feeling that way? Why are you allowing this, you know, all of that stuff? Have you felt yourself feeling those things and maybe even being built, beat up a little bit? You know, I think the body of Christ is in a pinch right now. It's in crunch. I mean, the whole world is, but the body of Christ is, we're trying to figure out, okay, yeah, going forward, what does it really look like? What, what, what would happen if it were illegal to meet in buildings all over the planet? What would happen? What would Christianity look like? What would we do? What would happen if we couldn't broadcast the gospel over the internet? How would we impact people? What would happen if I can't express my faith? What, what would I do? What kind of person, what kind of Christian would I be? Like when life really gets hard, if I lose my job, see, here's, here's, here's a big factor. A lot of us place uh, 
the promises of God, place too much emphasis on the material aspects of the promises of God. Now, I think God wants you wealthy. I think He wants you incredibly blessed so that you can be a blessing. But what if the things that you're praying for are not coming to pass in your life? What does that mean for who you are? You know, are you defining your experience with the Father and His heart for you based on what you have in your physical world around you right now? Are you with me? I'm I'm just thinking about some conversations. You know, don't Hold yourself to such a standard where if you don't have a particular promise in your life, you forget who you are as a Christian or you start to question God. See, what happens is you just have to respond in such a way where it's like, all right, I don't, I don't know why the world around me as a believer looks like it does right now in my personal life. And, and I recognize that I'm stressed and I'm under pressure and I might be making some bad decisions right now. But I'm not going to allow that to create a wedge within my own heart that hardens my heart to the Father because I feel guilty and condemned. I'm not going to let guilt, shame, and condemnation and pressure put me into a corner where I won't seek the Father and engage Him and yield myself and crack my heart open to Him and let Him love me in the midst of all of this stuff where I don't feel like I'm doing a very good job of processing through life right now. Those are the times where you especially, and I think that's why King David was just such a powerful example and God called him a man after his own heart. He's like, why are you cast down, oh my soul? Be lifted up. I think we need to tell ourselves that. Step outside of your body, look at yourself and say, stop it. Quit feeling so depressed. Quit feeling so guilty and condemned. Yeah, cut out the behavior. Just like Jesus treated the woman caught in adultery, you might need to do that to yourself. Step outside of yourself and look and say, look, who's condemning you? God's not condemning you. Quit, knock out the sin stuff, knock out that behavior, do whatever you need to do, find the new normal, call somebody, get them to pray for you, put some type of measures in place. But but remember who you are. No one condemns you. Now, go and sin no more. See, we get it in reverse order. We, start, we, we don't properly manage the freedom, so we feel guilty and condemned. Then we allow that to drive us further away from that new life that we have in Christ. Then we start redefining what kind of being that we are, and we define ourselves based on our failures because you don't have your job anymore. Life looks different and all those other things that used to define you. Now, internally, you're making these bad decisions. And you're just being beat up by the enemy and your own negative thoughts to be shoved back into a corner. And I don't want the body of Christ to come out of this process shell-shocked, feeling like you've stepped backward 10 years in your progression and your transformation in Christ. Remember who you are. Remember that you have this freedom within Him. Remember that. He's alive in you. You're alive in Him. and You're not defined by failure And be willing to take personal responsibility for this freedom. Now, the personal responsibility comes in of you putting the time. See, the Christian life is paradoxical. We labor to enter into the rest. We work out our own free gift of salvation. When you pray, believe those things that, that, that have been given to you will be yours. The standing in the midst is the transformational aspect of you putting on that new man in your mind, remembering who you are. Don't let the world define you. Don't let the failures define you. Don't let fear creep in. And pay attention. Pay attention if you're having the kind of thoughts. I'm not sure if I really want to go out so much anymore. You know, some elderly folks, and and I get it. You know, I'm not trying to downplay the health issue. I'm not trying to you know, play doctor or any of that kind of stuff. I am trying to stay informed. I'm looking. I have my own thoughts and beliefs about it. I don't, I don't want to, you know, I don't want people to die. <laughs> Sorry, that was inside joke in my own head. <clears throat> but, you know, I, I just don't want to see the body of Christ emerge from this weak and beaten up because we've poorly managed freedom in the midst of stress and difficulty. I want us to come out of this stronger, refined. I want us to come out of this with more faith toward Him, more innovative to spread the gospel, 
more energized and, and hopeful to experience the promises and the blessing of God. Detaching our identity from our jobs, detaching our identity from our failures, and doing the work, putting the work in to let that mindset be in you that is in Christ Jesus, that you are the righteousness of God in Him, to remember who you are. And it's, it's really the fruit of the Easter message of resurrection is that God, you, you can experience personal resurrection, as Mike said in the beginning, every day. You know, don't, don't just let the resurrection gospel story be good news for your ears. Let it be good news for your heart and your inner man as well. Live life energized. And, and you know, one way, and uh, I'll, I'll end with this, because I think one thing that we can do to get ourselves out of the funk that we're in, to get ourselves out of this, mm, this, this, this pressure that we're feeling from the world around us is, is help people. So I've got two questions here. And in the midst, this is just something super practical, easy to do. First question is, who do you want to help? And this will help you break out of maybe the funk that you're in and think outwardly, which then opens the channel for God to flow through you. So some very practical, who do you want to help? Think about who you want to help in, these, in this time. Like my mind naturally goes to the elderly that no one can come visit them. You know, so I, I want to sit down and pray and think about how can we be a blessing to those people? The people that they are only allowed visitors if they're approaching the actual end of their lives. You know, like right now there are people in isolation suffering alone because of how we're responding to this situation. That's on my heart. Who is it for you? Who do you want to help? Who, when you think about this, are you thinking about just yourself or are you thinking about other people? Who is it? You know, even in this moment, think about it. Who, who is it that, gosh, I, mean, I, I wasn't even aware of this. I wasn't even aware that this was a result of this situation. And then answer the question, how can you help them? How can we help them? These people that are struggling, these people that are, you know, my wife and I, we talked about these Government stimulus checks, which I almost want to puke a little bit thinking about that word. I know I got an amen there, but <clears throat> you know we're at a place where it's like what we're going to do is actually use that to help another family that's in need. Maybe a family that is just about to lose their home, or you know hasn't found a new job and needs a bridge over until they can work again. You know that that that's something very practical and basic, but. You know, th this is what, this, I, here's my dream. I want to come out of this hearing global stories of how the body of Christ just blew people's minds about how we remained faithful, we remained at peace, and how we came out of this not focused on ourselves, but focused on others. Because it's our love for one another that will be a testimony to the world that we follow Jesus, and it's our unity and our faith toward our common Father that will compel the world to believe that God sent Jesus into this earth. And so us digging into our faith, you know, the world looking at, well, prayer is not working. You guys believe more in hospitals than you do in prayer, and you guys are just bowing to the government and not meeting. You know, all, all the stuff that people are saying about church and faith right now you know, I want that to be obliterated and blown away because of all the stories of how the church has responded in the midst of this issue. That's the personal responsibility of freedom. And I think it's very easily answered. Who do you want to help? How can you help them? How can we help them? How can we be a blessing in this? How can we reach out? Not just to, you know, try to create some testimony to the world, but as a natural expression, you know, partially for you to lift yourself out, out of that darkness and that, you know, that, that pressure that you're feeling. And I know you know what I'm talking about. You sit in your home and you just kind of feel, mm. most of you by now, you've, per, you've made the choice to limit how much news you're watching. Why? Because you don't want that. You don't want those seeds growing in you. You've acknowledged it. Yes, it's happening, but you don't want to keep feeding yourself that. There's another step beyond that is, and that is beyond the self-protection. How can I rearrange my life so that I'm poised for the future? But now outside thinking. 
How can I reach outside of myself? You know, I've got these difficulties. I've got this, these processes. I've got this stuff that I've got to deal with, these struggles. But how can I reach outside of myself into the world to be the hands and feet of Christ? It's still limited right now. I don't really know what that looks like for all of us, but I feel like it will help us lift ourselves back up and, and quit sitting in all of the darkness and heaviness that we're sitting in and kind of raise our frequency and expectation and remembering that we are children of the Father. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We are the light in the world. We're the salt of the earth. We are the body of Christ in this earth with the mission and the strategy of love to show people what faith looks like, faith that means something, a life of Christianity that means something beyond just a crutch. You know, faith being in the, 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 our faith being evidence that there's something beyond just personal beliefs. It compels us. Why would they behave that way? Why would they do that? Why would, they, why would the entire body of Christ over the entire planet do all of these selfless acts? I just see it. I just see the body of Christ coming alive in this time. I see the spirit of the living God blowing on the flames of people's hearts. I see you as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, shedding away the outer world, letting go of the heaviness that's being created in this time and remembering who you are. I see innovation coming alive within you. I see entrepreneurship coming alive within you. I think we're going to come out of this seeing new ministries, new opportunities, new efforts to reach people. I think the body of it's time for us to actually shine. It's time for us to actually step out of the darkness and show the world the power of the spirit of the living God within us. You know, and sometimes it just starts with acknowledgement. It just starts with setting our face in that direction and trusting that God will show us the steps along the way because He will. And I thank you that your church is rising. I thank you that your church is hopeful. I thank you church, that your church is not limited by the death in the world, but is encouraged by your life within us. Father, we yield to you. We submit ourselves to your lordship and to your leading, and we trust that as we turn our faces toward you and as we put on that new man in our minds and as we allow you to nourish us in our inner man and that grace to come alive inside of us, we manage that freedom well, we quit living a life that is bringing guilt and condemnation, and we step outside of this and move beyond that to proclaim your gospel, to proclaim your kingdom, through good works and through the evidence of our own faith and through our kindness and our love toward one another. Father, I thank you that that is the direction that you're leading us as your children. And we are committed to that and we love you and we take personal responsibility to let you fuel us that way. Father, we thank you for the plan of salvation. We thank you for the gift, the free gift of salvation and righteousness through Christ. Jesus, we love you. We trust you. We thank you. You know, if you're watching today and <clears throat> you don't know the Lord, maybe you've never said yes to Jesus, it's not a magic formula. You know, for some people it's a process. There is that point of being born again where you believe. But I encourage you, jump on our website, forward.church. We have an article on there of who is Jesus and read through what he did for you, the price that he paid for you, how he destroyed everything that was against you to clear the way for you to have an open relationship with the Father. We have those resources out there. I hope that you take advantage of those. And when we can gather again, come hang out with us. Come worship with us. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to remind you, you know, I, 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 I love the fact that... Um, our church is still incredibly supportive. You know, um, our church is, uh, we haven't even really, maybe a little dip in, in finances, but not much. It's, it's not even really noticeable hardly. But, you know, in this process, I want to talk about giving for just a minute. I, I mentioned it at the end of the last service, but, you know, now's not the time to hoard and be stingy. 
You know, don't, don't think that I'm trying to manipulate you now because I'm worried about money. I'm not worried about money. I don't care if we have a building or not, honestly. We'll pack it, everybody into my living room and spill out the doors, back porch, backyard, and I'll have church there. I, I'm not. My point is that get, in this time now, you need things to keep your heart open to the Lord. And there's no more fundamental way than to take your hard-earned money, that money that you might even need right now, and give a fixed percentage of it to the work of the ministry. If it's not this church, then something. Because it's, it's not about you keeping God happy. It's not about you doing something where God will rebuke the devourer on your behalf. He has rebuked the devourer. There's nothing being held against you. It's not illegal if you don't tithe. You're just missing out on an opportunity to shift your heart and keep your heart open to Him. Just like getting over yourself and stepping out and being a, a blessing to the world around you helps your heart stay open to let God flow through you, so does giving, giving of your finances. You know, it's, when you give your money, it's telling your inner man and your being, this is not my God. This is not my provision. I'm going to use this to be a blessing because I'm acknowledging that God is my Father. And when you take that act... You're giving yourself an opportunity to believe. You're giving yourself an opportunity to remain in faith toward Him. Yes, you're sowing into ministries that have budgets and all that kind of stuff. Yes, that's happening. There's not some empty promise that you get the same rewards that that ministry gets. I, I don't know if that's true. That's true. But I hear that kind of stuff preached, and it's like, can we, just, can we just make it about what's actually going on between us and the Father without having to trying to hype these empty promises of charismatic whatever? I, I don't know. I, I'm not trying to be, I really am not trying to be negative. I just want to lift all of that stuff off and just make it about, I trust you, Lord. You are my provider. And one way that I can tell my entire being to be persuaded that you are my father is to give away something that I have worked for. I'm skimming right off the top this percentage as a, as a, as a testimony of your faithfulness and your provision in my life, and I'm giving this into the work of the ministry. Now, you add into that ministries that you believe in, churches that you believe in, that, that have added value to your life, and that you have purpose. You have a purpose for giving into that ministry. Not because you feel like you have to. Don't ever give out of obligation. Give out of a cheerful heart. Like, honestly, be happy and glad that you're getting to give. Because what it's doing, it, it, it's, if it's signaling to your entire being, we're going to trust God. God is my provider. This temporary construct of money, which they just pull out of thin air these days, doesn't even mean anything. It doesn't even mean anything. Like nothing. It means nothing. It's, it's an illusion. But, but given the system that we're in, it is a powerful tool to help me stay in faith toward God. And so I encourage you, be generous. Be giving. And like I said, if not this church, into something. And do it regularly. Make a decision in this time. You're going to trust God. God is your provider. And, and then you watch. I'm not going to make you any promises. That's between you and the Father. But you just watch. You watch. I have testimonies. I've heard all kinds of testimonies about remaining faithful in giving. So let me pray one last time and we'll close. Father, I thank you for all those that are watching. I thank you that we can... Uh, still share in community in some way and honor your presence that is within us. We are the church. And I, I just have this picture of the entire body of Christ, every single believer on the planet. It's almost like I'm in space and I see the globe and I see billions of lights and all of those lights are his believers. And all of those lights have the same light within them. And all of those lights are connected. And we are emitting that light into the world collectively, shining the love of God onto this earth, into this earth, because we are personally experiencing it. And the world can't help but take notice because of how we are responding to your love, Lord, and letting it flow through us as a testimony of your salvation and as a message of your love toward the world. Father, thank you that, you're, that this planet is blanketed in love through your body. We believe and we trust and we will manage that freedom to be a light for your kingdom. 
to bring glory and honor to your name. We love you. We love you. We love you. Amen. Amen. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message. And thank you to those of you who support Forward Ministries financially. You truly are changing the way the world sees God. You're helping people detox from performance-based religion and experience God's love for them. We're committed to helping you renew your mind so you'll experience transformation and move forward in every area of your life. I pray you're making this hard journey. Visit my website at clintbyers.com for hundreds of free teachings and articles that will empower you to renew your mind and put on your eternal identity in Christ. I'm especially excited about my tools for transformation that have original music and modern technology designed to help you slow down and connect with the Spirit of God in your heart. I'd like to invite you to partner with Forward Ministries. Help us continue to spread the gospel and develop resources that are empowering people to grow in their identity in Christ. Thank you again for joining me. I pray God's blessings and promises over you and your family today.